magic word Here in the secret kindergarten The world's best show for kids is starting The secret kindergarten radio show Use your ears and your imagination We're going to play, we're having fun Welcome back to the Secret Kindergarten Radio Show on Revolution Radio. This is a show for you. You right there. So how old are you? Are you two and a half? Are you three years old? Are you five years old and you have to go to stinky old school? Or are you just middle-aged like me? <laughs> oh, Are you 60 million years old? If you're 60 million years old, you must be a dinosaur. And if you're a dinosaur, you better not be naughty here on the Secret Kindergarten Radio Show or I'll flush you down the toilet. Yes, I will, because this show is for young children only. And I'm a big kid and my name's Gino, as in G. No! And I'm here to show you the Secret Kindergarten for the next two whole hours. I gotta learn a new song. So begins the secret kindergarten. And I'm feeling brave right now. I'm feeling very brave. I feel like I can do the right thing because I know it is the right thing to do. I feel brave because I can feel like I feel like I can do it. Even if my friend doesn't want me to do it. Even if mummy and daddy don't want me to do it. I feel brave. Do you feel brave sometimes? It's good to feel brave. I think you kids out there are all brave. I think you just are born with being brave, you know? Well, you stay being brave. And I'll stop blah, blah, blahing, and we'll play some nice music from Nancy Stewart. This one's called Bluebird. Check out nancymusic.com, the music of Nancy Stewart. She's got lots of free downloads too. Let's play another one. This one's called, my favorite, Doing the Penguin Waddle and Walk. Penguin waddle and walk. Tiny little penguin. 
the penguin waddle and walk we do in the penguin waddle and walk Some of my friends that listen to this show that are growing up, they say, oh my gosh, not doing the penguin waddle and walk. You can't play that song because it's stuck in my head all day. But I'm feeling brave today, so I'm going to play it anyway because I know it's the right thing to do because it's for all you young children out there. That's why it's important to be brave. And this one's called Everybody Has a Song to Sing. Every birdie has a song to sing Every birdie has a song to sing You hear it singing all day long For a birdie has to sing a song Every birdie has a song to sing And every baby has a song to sing Every baby has a song to sing Though it won't have any words It's the sweetest song you've ever heard Every baby has a song to sing Every mother has a song to sing Every mother has a song to sing A song for singing when it's light And a lullaby to sing at night Every mother has a song to sing Every daddy has a song to sing Every daddy has a song to sing You hear him holler out a song Or humming quietly along Every daddy has a song to sing Every grandma has a song to sing Every grandma has a song to sing when she sings her song to you, then it becomes your song too. Every grandma has a song to sing. Every grandpa has a song to sing. Every grandpa has a song to sing. A song of happiness or strife, a song he's carried all his life. Every grandpa has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing Everybody has a song to sing And when we're singing the same song You know we just can't do it wrong Everybody has a song to sing And when we're singing the same song You know we just can't do it wrong Everybody has a song to sing Everybody has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing. You stay tuned for the tarot card reading coming up because there's a reason I played that song. Now this song is called Going on a Fairy Ride, which is related to the tarot card that I'm about to play soon too. Where. Just hop aboard the ferry, it'll take us there 
cars and trucks and bicycles, walk-ons too. Riding on the ferry is the thing to do. Well, did you bring a snack to eat? Yes, I did. Did you bring some juice to drink? Yes, I did. Did you bring a book to read? Yes, I did. Did you bring some shoes for your feet? Yes, I did. Oh, we're going on a ferry ride. It doesn't matter where. Just hop aboard the ferry. It'll take us there. Cars and trucks and bicycles, walk-ons too. Riding on the ferry is the thing to do. Well, did you bring your sunglasses? Yes, I did. Did you bring the sunscreen? Yes, I did. Did you bring binoculars? Yes, I did. Did you bring your raincoat? Yes, I did. Oh, we're going on a ferry ride. It doesn't matter where. Just hop aboard the ferry. It'll take us there. Cars and trucks and bicycles, walk-ons too. Riding on the ferry is the thing to do. Well, did you bring your bicycle? Yes, I did. Did you bring your backpack? Yes, I did. Did you bring your family? Yes, I did. Did you bring your best friend? Yes, I did. Oh, we're going on a ferry ride. It doesn't matter where. Just hop aboard the ferry. It'll take us there. Cars and trucks and bicycles, walk-ons too. Riding on the ferry is the thing to do. Riding on the ferry is the thing to do. It's magical card time. <laughs> Tarot time. And this week. The card that I pulled was called was called the Fool card. Which a fool is probably people will use the word fool to call somebody that's a silly person. But this card, let's talk about what it means from the influence of the angels tarot. It's the start of something new or a fresh beginning. And this is where it starts for all of us. Some people don't get to start until they're very old. Like me, I'm only starting, I'm like 41 years old. Sometimes people never get to start their whole lives. But if mum and dad, your mummy and daddy spend lots of time with you in play, and if you do lots of play by yourself and with your friends and with your mummy and daddy, then you get to start something new and have your own special beginning of your journey at the right time in the lo in your life when you were just a kid i think as far as the secret kindergarten is concerned that the full card is is to come to you when you're a young child that's when you start your own special life your own special journey and according to the whimsical tarot corresponds to the Scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz. The Scarecrow, like the Fool, is an open-minded sort, blessed with childlike innocence. He sees only beauty and adventure among the pitfalls of life, and he embraces them with joyful exuberance. He constantly seeks out the unknown and explores endless possibilities. Everyone loves him. He's kind and courteous, caring and fun to be around. The problem with the fool is that he simply doesn't think things through. Even if mundane thought were a possibility for him, it would mean having ideals, making a stand, or taking positive action to bring them into reality. Instead, he much prefers to float along in the clouds, allowing destiny to take him where he will. He often gets into trouble. But it's important for you young children to be like the scarecrow, like the fool in the tarot, and play, explore, and have fun, and go on adventures. So you become smart and clever when you grow up. And now, let's quickly play a scarecrow story from the Wizard of Oz. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by Frank L. Baum Chapter 3. How Dorothy Saved the Scarecrow When Dorothy was left alone, she began to feel hungry, so she went to the cupboard and cut herself some bread. 
which she spread with butter. She gave some to Toto, and, taking a pail from the shelf, she carried it down to the little brook and filled it with clear, sparkling water. Toto ran over to the trees and began to bark at the birds sitting there. Dorothy went to get him and saw such delicious fruit hanging from the branches that she gathered some of it, finding it just what she wanted to help out her breakfast. Then she went back to the house, and having helped herself and Toto to a good drink of cool, clear water, she set about making ready for the journey to the city of emeralds. Dorothy had only one other dress, but that happened to be clean and was hanging on a peg beside her bed. It was gingham, with checks of white and blue, and although the blue was somewhat faded with many washings, it was still a pretty frock. The girl washed herself carefully, dressed herself in the clean gingham, and tied her pink sunbonnet on her head. She took a little basket and filled it with bread from the cupboard, laying a white cloth over the top. Then she looked down at her feet and noticed how old and worn her shoes were. "'They surely will never do for a long journey, Toto,' she said. And Toto looked up into her face with his little black eyes and wagged his tail to show he knew what she meant. At that moment, Dorothy saw lying on the table the silver shoes that had belonged to the Witch of the East. I wonder if they will fit me, she said to Toto. They would be just the thing to take a long walk in, for they could not wear out. She took off her old leather shoes and tried on the silver ones, which fitted her as well as if they had been made for her. Finally, she picked up her basket. Come along, Toto, she said. We will go to the Emerald City and ask the Great Oz how to get back to Kansas again. She closed the door, locked it, and put the key carefully in the pocket of her dress. And so, with Toto trotting along somberly behind her, she started on her journey. There were several roads nearby, but it did not take her long to find the one paved with yellow bricks. Within a short time, she was walking briskly toward the Emerald City her silver shoes tinkling merrily on the hard yellow roadbed. The sun shone bright, and the birds sang sweetly, and Dorothy did not feel nearly so bad as you might think a little girl would, who had been suddenly whisked away from her own country and set down in the midst of a strange land. She was surprised, as she walked along, to see how pretty the country was about her. There were neat fences on the sides of the road, painted a dainty blue color, and beyond them were fields of grain and vegetables in abundance. Evidently the munchkins were good farmers and able to raise large crops. Once in a while she would pass a house and the people came out to look at her and bow low as she went by, for everyone knew she had been the means of destroying the wicked witch and setting them free from bondage. The houses of the munchkins were odd-looking dwellings, for each was round with a big dome for a roof. All were painted blue, for in this country of the east, blue was the favorite color. Toward evening, when Dorothy was tired with her long walk and began to wonder where she should pass the night, she came to a house rather larger than the rest. On the green lawn before it, many men and women were dancing. Five little fiddlers played as loudly as possible, and the people were laughing and singing, while a big table nearby was loaded with delicious fruits and nuts, pies and cakes, and many other good things to eat. The people greeted Dorothy kindly and invited her to supper and to pass the night with them, for this was the home of one of the richest munchkins in the land, and his friends were gathered with him to celebrate their freedom from the bondage of the wicked witch. Dorothy ate a hearty supper and was waited upon by the rich munchkin himself, whose name was Bok. Then she sat upon a settee and watched the people dance. When Bok saw her silver shoes, he said, you must be a great sorceress. Why? asked the girl. Because you wear silver shoes and have killed the wicked witch. Besides, you have white in your frock and only witches and sorcerers wear white. My dress is blue and white checked, said Dorothy, smoothing out the wrinkles in it. It's kind of you to wear that, said Bok. Blue is the color of the munchkins and white is the witch color. So we know you are a friendly witch. Dorothy did not know what to say to this for all the people seemed to think her a witch, and she knew very well she was only an ordinary little girl who had come by the chance of a cyclone into a strange land. When she had tired watching the dancing, Bach led her into the house where he gave her a room with a pretty bed in it. The sheets were made of blue cloth, and Dorothy slept soundly in them till morning, with Toto curled up on the blue rug beside her. 
she ate a hearty breakfast and watched a wee munchkin baby who played with Toto and pulled his tail and crowed and laughed in a way that greatly amused Dorothy. Toto was a fine curiosity to all the people, for they had never seen a dog before. How far is it to the Emerald City? the girl asked. I do not know, answered Bok gravely, for I have never been there. It is better for people to keep away from Oz, unless they have business with him. But it is a long way to the Emerald City, and it will take you many days. The country here is rich and pleasant, but you must pass through rough and dangerous places before you reach the end of your journey. This worried Dorothy a little, but she knew that only the great Oz could help her get to Kansas again, so she bravely resolved not to turn back. She bade her friends goodbye, and again started along the road of yellow brick. When she had gone several miles, she thought she would stop to rest, and so climbed to the top of the fence beside the road and sat down. There was a great cornfield beyond the fence, and not far away she saw a scarecrow, placed high on a pole to keep the birds from the ripe corn. Dorothy leaned her chin upon her hand and gazed thoughtfully at the scarecrow. Its head was a small sack stuffed with straw, with eyes, nose, and mouth painted on it to represent a face. An old pointed blue hat that had belonged to some munchkin was perched on his head, and the rest of the figure was a blue suit of clothes, worn and faded, which had also been stuffed with straw. On the feet were some old boots with blue tops, such as every man wore in this country, and the figure was raised above the stalks of corn by means of the pole stuck up its back. While Dorothy was looking earnestly into the queer painted face of the scarecrow, she was surprised to see that one of the eyes slowly wink at her. She thought she must have been mistaken at first, for none of the scarecrows in Kansas ever wink. But presently the figure nodded its head to her in a friendly way. Then she climbed down from the fence and walked up to it, while Toto ran around the pole and barked. "'Good day,' said the scarecrow, in a rather husky voice. "'Did you speak?' asked the girl, in wonder. "'Certainly,' answered the scarecrow. "'How do you do?' "'I'm pretty well, thank you,' replied Dorothy politely. "'How do you do?' "'I'm not feeling well,' said the scarecrow, with a smile. "'For it's very tedious being perched up here night and day to scare away crows.' "'Can't you get down?' asked Dorothy. "'No, for this pole is stuck up my back. "'If you will please take away the pole, I shall be greatly obliged to you.' Dorothy reached up both arms and lifted the figure off the pole, for, being stuffed with straw, it was quite light. "'Thank you very much,' said the Scarecrow, when he had been set down on the ground. "'I feel like a new man.' Dorothy was puzzled at this, for it sounded queer to hear a stuffed man speak and to see him bow and walk along beside her. "'Who are <coughs> you?' asked the Scarecrow, when he had stretched himself and yawned. "'And where are you going?' "'My name is Dorothy,' said the girl. "'And I am going to the Emerald City to ask the Great Oz to send me back to Kansas.' "'Where is the Emerald City?' he inquired. "'And who is Oz?' "'Why, don't you know?' she returned in surprise. "'You see, I am stuffed, so I have no brains at all.' he answered sadly. "'Oh,' said Dorothy, "'I'm awfully sorry for you.' "'Do you think,' he asked, "'if I go to the Emerald City with you, "'that Oz would give me some brains?' "'I cannot tell,' she returned. "'But you may come with me if you like. "'If Oz will not give you any brains, "'you will be no worse off than you are now.' "'That is true,' said the Scarecrow. "'You see,' he continued confidentially, "'I don't mind my legs and arms and body being stuffed "'because I cannot get hurt.' If anyone treads on my toes or sticks a pin into me, it doesn't matter, for I can't feel it. But I do not want people to call me a fool, and if my head stays stuffed with straw instead of with brains, as yours is, how am I ever to know anything? I understand how you feel, said the little girl, who was truly sorry for him. If you will come with me, I'll ask Oz to do all he can for you. Thank you, he answered gratefully. They walked back to the road. Dorothy helped him over the fence, and they started along the path of the yellow brick for the Emerald City. 
Toto did not like this addition to the party at first. He smelled around the stuffed man as if he suspected there might be a nest of rats in the straw, and he often growled in an unfriendly way at the scarecrow. "'Don't mind Toto,' said Dorothy to her new friend. "'He never bites.' "'Oh, I'm not afraid,' replied the scarecrow. "'He can't hurt the straw. Do let me carry that basket for you. I shall not mind it, for I can't get tired. I'll tell you a secret.' he continued, as he walked along. "'There is only one thing in the world I am afraid of.' "'What is that?' asked Dorothy. "'The munchkin farmer who made you?' "'No,' answered the scarecrow. "'It's a lighted match.' And that was How Dorothy Saved the Scarecrow. And I think the scarecrow really does. <laughs> does symbolize young children he's quite brave and he's getting smarter and smarter every day and now we're moving on to our nature section now do you know where i am Or what I'm standing under. I'm under a tree. And this nature segment's about trees. In particular, the poplar tree. First time we talked about trees on the secret kindergarten. Oh, it's windy here. <laughs> I think I'm going to go straight into a story about a poplar tree so we can learn about what the poplar tree is all about. So this one's called The Poplar Tree by Flora J. Cook. The Poplar Tree one night, just at sunset, an old man found the pot of gold which lies under the end of the rainbow. His home was far beyond the dark forest through which he was passing. The pot of gold was heavy, and he soon began to look for a safe place in which to hide it until morning. A poplar tree stood near the path, stretching its branches straight out from the trunk. That was the way the poplar trees grew in those days. Ah, said the man, this tree is the very place in which to conceal my treasure. The trees are all asleep, I see, and these leaves are large and thick. He carefully placed the pot of gold in the tree and hurried home to tell of his good fortune. Very early the next morning, Iris, the rainbow messenger, missed the precious pot of gold. She hastened to Zeus and told him of the loss. Zeus immediately sent Hermes in search of it. Hermes soon came to the forest where it was hidden. He awakened the trees and asked them if they had seen the pot of gold. They shook their heads sleepily and murmured something which Hermes could not understand. Then Zeus himself spoke to them. Hold your arms high above your heads, he said that I may see that all are awake. Up went the arms, but alas, down to the ground came the pot of gold. The poplar tree was more surprised than anyone else. He was a very honest tree, and for a moment hung his head in grief and shame. Then again he stretched his arms high above his head and said, Forgive me, great father, Hereafter I shall stand in this way, that you may know that I hide nothing from the sun, my king. At first the poplar tree was much laughed at. He was often told that he looked like a great umbrella, which a storm had turned inside out. But as years went by, every small poplar was taught to grow as fearless, straight, and open-hearted as himself and the whole poplar family became respected and loved for its uprightness and strength. The End Oh, I love poplar trees. 
Isn't that amazing? I wonder if you've seen a poplar tree before. I wonder if your mummy and daddy can show you a poplar tree. You can look out when you go for a drive or when you go for a walk at the park. But poplar trees, sometimes called the trembling tree, because oh, let's go back out to the let's go back out into nature. Because of how they shake in the wind. They're very tall, straight and upright, but the wind shakes them around, so they're very sensitive as well. And the poplar tree is a magical tree, like all trees. And the poplar tree is said to send messages through the shaking leaves to those who are able to listen. What would the tree say to you? Shamans, or even druids, magic people, would communicate with fairies by listening to what they had to say through the poplar tree. And the poplar tree makes you brave. And that's why the poplar tree is on today's episode of Secret Kindergarten Radio Show. Because it's about bravery. Like the scarecrow, and the poplar tree, and the fool card. And me, feeling brave, playing the music I want to play for you. And it is also said that the poplar tree is a house for all kinds of magical beings that we can't see. Maybe we can see them if we go to the poplar tree and listen and look. The poplar tree teaches us how to connect with the wider world and the whole universe, which I reckon you young children do too. So the poplar tree has the secret kindergarten seal of approval and highly recommended for you to play under and play around and play with mummy and daddy in the park near the poplar trees. I wonder if you can find a poplar tree with mummy and daddy. That would be super awesome. And that's enough blah 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 from me. We're going to play some music by Nancy Stewart from nancymusic.com. A 
shady place to sit and sing. Every tree has roots, a trunk, and leaves, and flowers too. Flowers and leaves, and trunk, and roots all have a job to do. Flowers and leaves, and trunk, and roots all have a job to do. like little trees. It's broccoli. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's long and yellow, and sometimes we pop it. It's corn. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's round and green, and we call it a head. It's a head of lettuce. Lots of cool songs about trees and plants. <laughs> and this one's called the Leprechaun Song. Do you know what a leprechaun is? <laughs> maybe if you go to the poplar trees, maybe you'll see a leprechaun. Shamrocks were growing on the ground Along came a leprechaun He didn't make a sound He picked a little shamrock And jumped up in a tree Then he put it in his pocket And he slapped his little knees 
And he clapped his tiny hands And he stamped his little feet And he said this will bring a little luck to me I want an apricorn <laughs> This one's called Garden Party Amazing music from Nancy Stewart, nancymusic.com. I'm so grateful for her music. It's so good, and it makes the show really, really cool. And she teaches young children through her music, which is the best way. If you need to say anything, that's the best way to do it, I reckon. You don't want to hear too much of me going blah, blah, blah. But let's listen to the song Trees one more time because that's got so much cool stuff in it. Every tree has roots and trunk and leaves and flowers too. The flowers and leaves and trunk and roots all have a job to do. It all begins with the flowers, for they keep the seeds that grow. When carried by the wind, the birds and squirrels down Every tree has roots, a trunk, and leaves, and flowers, too. Flowers and leaves and trunk and roots all have a job to do. Leaves are a food factory, using sun and water, too. We call it photosynthesis, but the trees just call it food. Every tree has roots, a trunk, and leaves, and flowers, too. Flowers and leaves and trunk and roots all have a job to do. The trunk is the high 
highway of the tree takes the water from the roots below up to the leaves then it sends the food back down so the roots will grow every tree has roots and trunk and leaves and flowers too flowers and leaves and trunk and roots all have a job to do roots take the water and learning about trees myself because coming up to springtime here in New Zealand and we just planted two apple trees and two pear trees and one of the apple trees comes all the way from where it is eastern time in the world somewhere near New York at least it's a northern spy apple tree, and I can't wait to try one of those apples when it gets some. But the pear trees, pear trees take a long time, a long time. I might have to wait till I'm 50 years old. <laughs> I might have to wait eight or nine years to try one of my amazing pear trees. And that's something to really look forward to. And let's play another one of these amazing songs again. Plant a little seed. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's orange and rabbits like to eat it. It's a carrot. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one grows under the ground, and when it's ready to eat, you have to dig it up. It's a potato. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. You might call this one little trees because it looks like little trees. It's broccoli. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's long and yellow, and sometimes we pop it. It's corn. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's round and green, and we call it a head. It's a head of lettuce. New Zealand now's the time to plant seeds as well for our vegetable garden. Coming up to the top of the hour ad break. We'll see you when we get back. And this is Gino from the Secret Kindergarten. And thank you for tuning in to Revolution.radio, the number one listener supported radio station in the whole world. So please help support our efforts and airtime by visiting the station's donation section on our website, revolution.radio. Now it is story time, the adventures of Maya the Bee. Let's see what Maya is getting up to in chapter four, Effie and Bobby. Chapter 4 of The Adventures of Maya the Bee Read by Betsy Bush The Adventures of Maya the Bee by Valdemar Bonsells 
Translated by Adele Zold Seltzer and Arthur Guterman. Chapter 4 Effie and Bobby. When Maya awoke the next morning in the corolla of a blue Canterbury bell, she heard a fine, faint rustling in the air and felt her blossom bed quiver as from a tiny, furtive tap tapping. Through the open corolla came a damp whiff of grass and earth, and the air was quite chill. In some apprehension, she took a little pollen from the yellow stamens, scrupulously performed her toilet, then warily picked her steps, ventured to the outer edge of the drooping blossom. A fine, cool rain was coming down with a light plash, covering everything all round with millions of bright silver pearls, which clung to the leaves and flowers, rolled down the green paths of the blades of grass, and refreshed the brown soil. What a change in the world! It was the first time in the child bee's young life that she had seen rain. It filled her with wonder, it delighted her, yet she was a little troubled. She remembered Cassandra's warning never to fly abroad in the rain. It must be difficult, she realized, to move your wings when the drops beat them down. And the cold really hurt, and she missed the quiet golden sunshine that gladdened the earth and made it a place free from all care. It seemed to be very early still. The animal life in the grass was just beginning. From the concealment of her lofty bluebell, Maya commanded a splendid view of the social life coming awake beneath. Watching it, she forgot, for the moment, her anxiety and mounting homesickness. It was too amusing for anything to be safe in a hiding place high up and look down on the doings of the grass dwellers below. Slowly, however, her thoughts went back, back to the home she had left, to the bee state, and to the protection of its close solidarity. There, on this rainy day, the bees would be sitting together, glad of the day of rest, doing a little construction here and there on the cells, or feeding the larvae. Yet, on the whole, the hive was very quiet and Sunday-like when it rained. Only sometimes messengers would fly out to see how the weather was, and from what quarter the wind was blowing. The queen would go about her kingdom from story to story, testing things, bestowing a word of praise or blame, laying an egg here and there, and bringing happiness with her royal presence wherever she went. She might pat one of the younger bees on the head to show her approval of what it had already done, or she might ask it about its new experiences. How delighted a bee would be to catch a glance or receive a gracious word from the queen. Oh, thought Maya, how happy it made you to be able to count yourself one in a community like that, to feel that everybody respected you, and you had the powerful protection of the state. Here, out in the world, lonely and exposed, she ran great risks of her life. She was cold, too, and supposing the rain were to keep up, what would she do? How would she find something to eat? There was scarcely any honey juice in the Canterbury Bell, and the pollen would soon give out. For the first time, Maya realized how necessary the sunshine is for a life of vagabondage. Hardly anyone would set out on adventure, she thought, if it weren't for the sunshine. The very recollection of it was cheering, and she glowed with secret pride that she had had the daring to start life on her own hook. The number of things she had already seen and experienced— more, ever so much more, than the other bees were likely to know in a whole lifetime. Experience was the most precious thing in life, worth any sacrifice, she thought. A troop of migrating ants were passing by, and singing as they marched through the cool forest of grass. They seemed to be in a hurry. Their crisp morning song, in rhythm with their march, touched the little bee's heart with melancholy. Few our days on earth shall be, fast the moments flit. First-class robbers such as we do not care a bit. They were extraordinarily well-armed and looked saucy, bold, and dangerous. The song died away under the leaves of the colt's foot, but some mischief seemed to have been done there. A rough, hoarse voice sounded, and the small leaves of a young dandelion were energetically thrust aside. Maya saw a corpulent blue beetle push its way out. 
It looked like a half-sphere of dark metal shimmering with lights of blue and green and occasional black. It may have been two or even three times her size. Its hard sheath looked as though nothing could destroy it, and its deep voice positively frightened her. The song of the soldiers apparently had roused him out of sleep. He was cross. His hair was still rumpled, and he rubbed the sleep out of his cunning little blue eyes. "'Make way! I'm coming! Make way!' He seemed to think that people would step aside at the mere announcement of his approach. "'Thank the Lord I'm not in his way,' thought Maya, feeling very safe in her high, swaying nook of concealment. Nevertheless, her heart went pit-a-pat, and she withdrew a little deeper into the flower-bell. The beetle moved with a clumsy lurch through the wet grass, presenting a not exactly elegant appearance. Directly under Maya's blossom was a withered leaf. Here he stopped, shoved the leaf aside, and made a step backward. Maya saw a hole in the ground. "'Well,' she thought, all agog with curiosity, "'the things there are in the world. I never thought of such a thing. Life's not long enough for all there is to see.' She kept very quiet. The only sound was the soft pelting of the rain. Then she heard the beetle calling down the hole. "'If you want to go hunting with me, you'll have to make up your mind to get right up. It's already bright daylight.' He was feeling so very superior for having waked up first that it was hard for him to be pleasant. A few minutes passed before the answer came. Then Maya heard a thin, chirping voice rise out of the hole. "'For goodness sake, do close the door up there. It's raining in.' The beetle obeyed. He stood in an expectant attitude, his head cocked a little to one side, and squinted through the crack. "'Please hurry,' he grumbled. Maya was tense with eagerness to see what sort of a creature would come out of the hole. She crept so far out on the edge of the blossom that a drop of rain fell on her shoulder and gave her a start. She wiped herself dry. Below her, the withered leaf heaved. A brown insect crept out slowly. Maya thought it was the queerest specimen she had ever seen. It had a plump body, set on extremely thin, slow-moving legs, and a fearfully thick head, with little upright feelers. It looked flustered. "'Good morning, Effie, dear.' The beetle went slim with politeness. He was all politeness, and his body seemed really slim." "'How did you sleep? How did you sleep, my precious, my all?' Effie took his hand rather stonily. "'It can't be, Bobby,' she said. "'I can't go with you. We're creating too much talk.' Bobby looked quite alarmed. "'I, I don't understand,' he stammered. "'I don't understand. Is our new-found happiness to be wrecked by such nonsense?' Effie, think, think the thing over. What do you care what people say? You have your hole. You can creep into it whenever you like. And if you go down far enough, you won't hear a syllable. Effie smiled a sad, superior smile. Bobby, you don't understand. I have my own views in the matter. Besides, there's something else. You have been exceedingly indelicate. You took advantage of my ignorance. You let me think you were a rose beetle, and yesterday the snail told me you were a tumble bug. A considerable difference. He saw you engaged in, well, doing something I don't care to mention. I'm sure you will now admit that I must take back my word. Bobby was stunned. When he recovered from the shock, he burst out angrily. No, I don't understand. I can't understand. I want to be loved for myself and not for my business. If only it weren't dung, said Effie offishly. Anything but dung and I shouldn't be so particular. And please remember, I'm a young widow who lost her husband only three days ago under the most tragic circumstances. He was gobbled up by the shrew mouse. And it isn't proper for me to be gadding about. A young widow should lead a life of complete retirement. So, good-bye. Pop into her hole went Effie, 
as though a puff of wind had blown her away. Maya would never have thought it possible that anyone could dive into the ground as fast as that. Effie was gone, and Bobby stared in blank bewilderment down the empty dark opening, looking so utterly stupid that Maya had to laugh. Finally he roused and shook his small round head in angry distress, his feelers drooping dismally like two rain-soaked fans. People nowadays no longer appreciate fineness of character and respectability, he sighed. Effie is heartless. I didn't dare admit it to myself, but she is. She's absolutely heartless. But even if she hasn't got the right feelings, she ought to have the good sense to be my wife. Maya saw the tears come to his eyes, and her heart was seized with pity. But the next instant Bobby stirred. He wiped the tears away and crept cautiously behind a small mound of earth, which his friend had probably shoveled out of her dwelling. A little flesh-colored earthworm was coming along through the grass. It had the queerest way of propelling itself, by first making itself long and thin, then short and thick. Its cylinder of a body consisted of nothing but delicate rings that pushed and groped forward noiselessly. Suddenly, startling Maya, Bobby made one step out of his hiding place, caught hold of the worm, bit it in two, and began calmly to eat the one half, heedless of its desperate wriggling or the wriggling of the other half in the grass. It was a tiny little worm. Patience, said Bobby. It will soon be over. But while he chewed, his thoughts seemed to revert to Effie. His Effie, whom he had lost for ever and I, and great tears rolled down his cheeks. Maya pitied him from the bottom of her heart. Dear me, she thought, there certainly is a lot of sadness in the world. At that moment, she saw the half of the worm which Bobby had set aside making a hasty departure. Did you ever see the like? she cried, surprised into such a loud tone that Bobby looked around, wondering where the sound had come from. Make way, he called. But I'm not in your way, said Maya. Where are you, then? You must be somewhere. Up here, up above you, in the bluebell. I believe you, but I'm no grasshopper. I can't turn my head up far enough to see you. Why did you scream? The half of the worm is running away. Yes, said Bobby, looking after the retreating fraction. The creatures are very lively. I've lost my appetite. With that, he threw away the remnant which he was still holding in his hand, and this worm portion also retreated in the other direction. Maya was completely puzzled, but Bobby seemed to be familiar with this peculiarity of worms. "'Don't suppose that I always eat worms,' he remarked. "'You see, you don't find roses everywhere.' "'Tell the little one at least which way its other half ran,' cried Maya in great excitement. Bobby shook his head gravely. "'Those whom fate has rent asunder, let no man join together again,' he observed. "'Who are you?' Maya, of the Nation of Bees. I'm glad to hear it. I have nothing against the bees. Why are you sitting about? Bees don't usually sit about. Have you been sitting there long? I slept here. Indeed. There was a note of suspicion in Bobby's voice. I hope you slept well. Very well. Did you just wake up? Yes, said Maya, who had shrewdly guessed that Bobby would not like her having overheard his conversation with Effie the cricket, and did not want to hurt his feelings again. Bobby ran hither and thither, trying to look up and see Maya. Wait, he said, if I raise myself on my hind legs and lean against that blade of grass, I'll be able to see you, and you'll be able to look into my eyes. You want to, don't you? Why, I do indeed. I'd like to very much. 
Bobby found a suitable prop, the stem of a buttercup. The flower tipped a little to one side so that Maya could see him perfectly as he raised himself on his hind legs and looked up at her. She thought he had a nice, dear, friendly face, but not so very young any more and cheeks rather too plump. He bowed, setting the buttercup a-rocking, and introduced himself. Bobby, of the family of rose beetles. Maya had to laugh to herself. She knew very well he was not a rose beetle. He was a dung beetle. But she passed the matter over in silence, not caring to mortify him. Don't you mind the rain? she asked. Oh, no. I'm accustomed to the rain. From the roses, you know. It's usually raining there. Maya thought to herself, After all, I must punish him a little for his brazen lies. He's so frightfully vain. Bobby, she said with a sly smile, What sort of a hole is that one there, under the leaf? Bobby started. A hole? A hole, did you say? There are very many holes round here. It's probably just an ordinary hole. You have no idea how many holes there are in the ground. Bobby had hardly uttered the last word when something dreadful happened. In his eagerness to appear indifferent, he had lost his balance and toppled over. Maya heard a despairing shriek, and the next instant saw the beetle lying flat on his back in the grass, his arms and legs waving pitifully in the air. I'm done for, he wailed. I'm done for. I can't get back on my feet again. I'll never be able to get back on my feet again. I'll die. I'll die in this position. Have you ever heard of a worse fate? He carried on so that he did not hear Maya trying to comfort him, and he kept making efforts to touch the ground with his feet. But each time he'd painfully get hold of a bit of earth, it would give way, and he'd fall over again on his high half-sphere of a back. The case looked really desperate, and Maya was honestly concerned. He was already quite pale in the face, and his cries were heart-rending. "'I can't stand it! I can't stand this position!' he yelled. "'At least turn your head away!' Don't torture a dying man with your inquisitive stares. If only I could reach a blade of grass or the stem of the buttercup. You can't hold on to the air. Nobody can do that. Nobody can hold on to the air. Maya's heart was quivering with pity. Wait, she cried. I'll try to turn you over. If I try very hard, I am bound to succeed. But Bobby, Bobby, dear man, don't yell like that. Listen to me. If I bend a blade of grass over and reach the tip of it to you, will you be able to use it and save yourself? Bobby had no ears for her suggestion. Frightened out of his senses, he did nothing but kick and scream. So little Maya, in spite of the rain, flew out of her cover over to a slim green blade of grass beside Bobby, and clung to it near the tip. It bent under her weight and sank directly above Bobby's wriggling limbs. Maya gave a little cry of delight. "'Catch hold of it!' she called. Bobby felt something tickle his face and quickly grabbed at it, first with one hand, then with the other, and finally with his legs, which had splendid sharp claws, two each. Bit by bit, he drew himself along the blade until he reached the base, where it was thicker and stronger, and he was able to turn himself over on it. He heaved a tremendous sigh of relief. "'Good God!' he explained. "'That was awful! But for my presence of mind, I should have fallen a victim to your talkativeness.' "'Are you feeling better?' asked Maya. Bobby clutched his forehead. "'Thanks, thanks. When this dizziness passes, I'll tell you all about it.' But Maya never got the answer to her question. A field sparrow came hopping through the grass in search of insects, 
and the little bee pressed herself close to the ground and kept very quiet until the bird had gone. When she looked around for Bobby, he had disappeared. So she too made off, for the rain had stopped and the day was clear and warm. Oh, Maya the bee. It seems like the more adventurous she get becomes, and the braver she gets, the more she cares about others, others around her. And she's kind of like the fool, the scarecrow, just getting out there and getting amongst it and living her life. Let's play some music. Turn out the light. get stuck on the edge of the web <laughs> all right we're coming up to an ad break let's stay tuned because we have not one but two awesome group activities coming up and i think they're good for people of all ages but it's always for the young children always for you out there we'll see you after the ad break 
This is Gino from The Secret Kindergarten, and thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio on freedomslips.com, revolution.radio as well. The number one listener-supported radio station in the world, so please help support our efforts and airtime by visiting the station's donation section on our website, revolution.radio. Here we go. It's group activity time. <laughs> this is a breathing activity. All right. This is quite a funny one, guys. Okay, first off. Breathing activity is for our courage and our bravery. Doing this, it makes us more brave and more courageous so we can go out there and live our lives and be who we're supposed to be, be who we were born to be. So let's focus on our breath. Let's concentrate on our breathing. Let's pay attention to our breathing. And we're going to pretend to be all kinds of animals. <laughs> First one, we're gonna roar like the animal we talked about last week, the tiger. Okay, you ready? Let's do it. Let's roar like a tiger. Roar! <laughs> Let's try that again. Breathe in and roar like a tiger. <laughs> I think I'm waking up the neighbors. It's very early in the morning here in New Zealand. Roar! Think that sounds like a tiger? What about you? Can you sound more like a tiger than me? Oh, I feel good after doing that. Now let's go for something a bit smaller. Let's pant like a puppy dog. I feel my breath going in and out really fast and really shallow. You panting like a puppy dog? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I can feel all this energy going through me. All right, next up, we're going to hiss like a snake. Let's go. Big breath in. And hiss like a snake. You hissing like a snake? It feels pretty good. This is like a snake. I feel like I'm in the jungle with this music too. Puff from hissing like a snake. Don't forget to breathe. <laughs> Don't forget to breathe in between. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Okay, this one. We're gonna laugh like a donkey. How do you do that? Doesn't matter. We're gonna laugh like a donkey. That's it. Let's do it. <laughs> I sound like a donkey. <laughs> oh man, it's good to laugh. A donkey really sounds like. E -oh, e -oh, e -oh. <laughs> oh. 
I think my neighbors are going to get very worried. <laughs> so you laughing? You laughing like a donkey? Come on. Donkeys out there. Go my donkeys. <laughs> We're now. Oh. After all that, I'm tired. I think I'm gonna go into hibernation. I'm going to snore like a bear. Come on, snore like a bear, everybody. fell asleep don't fall asleep snoring like a bear is so relaxing oh Whew. I feel really good next up This is a really good one. We're going to blow like a whale blows the air out of his spout. All right. Let's go. Big breath in and we're going to blow out of our spout. Let's breathe in and blow out our spout. Breathe in and blow out our spout. mouth up wide into a big breathe in and open your mouth up wide and yawn did that sound like a lion yawning <laughs> breathe in and yawn it's definitely easy for me to yawn this early in the morning for me. Breathe in and yawn like a ya lion, <laughs> like a yayan, <laughs> yawning like a yayan. Oh, okay. Now I'm really gonna wake the neighbors up with this one. Let's wake everybody up. Let's go. We're gonna howl like a coyote. Are you ready? Big breath in. Let's howl like a coyote. Oh! Big breath in. And let's howl like a coyote. Oh! Big breath in. And let's howl like a coyote. Oh!
Ooh, that feels really good. Okay. Last one. It's very gentle and delicate. And let's try our best. Sniff like a bunny. You sniff like a bunny? Sniffing like a bunny, there's really little breaths, they're tiny little breaths. Almost like the rat from the other week. Oh. That's it. How do you feel? Oh, I feel really awake. I feel ready. <laughs> Even though we're coming up towards the end of the show, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling energized. I'm feeling brave. So, one final step, okay? When we hold our breath for five seconds, are we going to be strong? Because when we hold our breath for five seconds, we're doing it to be strong, invincible, and convincible. Okay, so we're going to make ourselves brave by holding our breath in for five seconds. Ready? Let's take a deep, deep breath in and I'm going to count to five. I'll count to five for you. One, two, three, four, five and breathe out. Okay, we're going to breathe in to be invincible. Ready? Breathe in, to be invincible, one, two, three, four, five, and breathe out, and we're invincible. Okay, we're going to breathe in to be convincible, and convincible is, being convincible is saying things like we really mean it. Okay, so let's breathe in to be convincible, ready? Big breath in, let's hold it for five seconds, one, two, three, four. Five and breathe out oh, to be convincible. That's us. We're strong. We're invincible. We're convincible. We're brave. All right. Whew. That was a crazy activity. I want to do more of those. But for now, let's play some more music.
Reach way up high and sit back down Kids have lots of energy, they're always on the go Running, jumping, dancing, you need energy to grow Get up and shake, 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 shake your hands Jump, jump, jump up and down Turn, 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 turn around Reach way up high and sit back down Reach to the sky and sit back down Energy, 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 energy are hibernating Oh yes, the bears are hibernating They're snuggled down in their dens Like all of their friends Just waiting for the spring to come Oh, the bears are hibernating again The snakes are hibernating Oh yes, the snakes are hibernating they're snuggled down in their dens with all of their friends just waiting for the spring to come. Oh, the snakes are hibernating again. The bats are hibernating. Oh yes, the bats are hibernating. They're sleeping upside down, hanging around just waiting for the spring to come. Oh, the bats are hibernating again The frogs are hibernating Oh yes, the frogs are hibernating They're snuggled down in the ground Where they don't make a sound Just waiting for the spring to come Oh, the frogs are hibernating again but when the spring comes with the warming sun, the animals start to move. They're in a hungry mood. They go looking for food. They're getting back in the groove. Getting back in the groove. Getting back in the groove. But now the bears are hibernating and the snakes hibernating the bats are hanging around sleeping upside down just waiting for the spring to come oh the frogs are hibernating again oh the animals are hibernating again Little mouse, little mouse, where did you go? Are you in the red house? I don't know. <laughs> All right, everybody. Coming up to the end of the Secret Kindergarten Radio Show for another Saturday. This group activity, final group activity, is called TikTok. And in this one, we're going to sway from side to side like a pendulum on a clock. And this game helps us develop our bodily awareness and practice moving our bodies with control. What sound, does a, what sound does a clock make? Does anyone know what a grandfather clock is? Does anyone know what a pendulum is? Right, we're going to practice swaying side to side like the pendulum of a grandfather clock. That's the part that goes, makes the, the clock go tick-tock. 
So let's sit with our back straight and our body relaxed. We put our hands on the floor and our sides. Okay, now let's raise our right hand together and put my other hand on the floor next to me and let's lean to the right. And let's lean to the left and we can catch our weight with our left our left hand and now let's lean back tick top side to side like a grandfather clock can you feel your body moving can you feel when you're in the middle it's easy it's all balanced tick top Tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk, like a clock until I find my center. Stop. And when we're in the center, we can stop. Let's do that again. Tick, talk, like a clock until I find my center. Stop. Now I'm in the center, nice and balanced. Right. Let's do that again. Tick, tock, side to side. Like a grandfather clock until I find my center. Stop. You stop when you're in the center. Do that one more time. Turn the music up and we tick tock, let's go. Tick tock. Tick tock. Tick tock. Tick tock. Like a grandfather clock. Until I find my center, stop. You stop in the center. Let's do one more time. Tick. Talk. Tick. Talk. Like a grandfather clock. Until I find my center. How was that? <laughs> I think that was harder for me than it should be. <laughs> oh, I can really feel my hips on that one. <laughs> oh, that's the end of another show, Secret Kindergarten Radio. And thanks so much for tuning in. And for all the mummies and daddies out there, if you do want to um, catch up or if you do want to use any of this um, material from my shows, you can go on to thesecretkindergarten.com and you can check out the stuff there. And there's links to all the stories and stuff that I played. And also you can replay these shows. You can have them on in the background while you play with your young children. So all the young children out there, I love you. And thanks so much for listening. And we're going to see you next week. Secret Kindergarten Radio Show. All the best out there. Have a lovely weekend. Hope you get to see a poplar tree. And we'll see you at the next one.